Well, what can we say about Frida Kahlo that has not been said before? I think that what I'm going to try to do is to bring you a Frida Kahlo alive. I want to share with you many things of Frida. Entra, first film clip, please. Ahí la tiene. Now, what is it about Frida Kahlo that brings us together? Certainly, the quality of her art, certainly her tragic life, the, all of those things. But I believe that in a, in a deeper way, Frida is perhaps the most Mexican of artists. And when I say Mexican, I do not mean folkloric. I do not mean uh, the stereotypes that sometimes we confuse with Mexico. What I mean is this synthesis of many diverse things that is Mexico. Mexico is a country where the European and the indigenous intermarry, and later the African. And out of this first encounter, here you see it painted by Orozco, a new human being emerges. A human being that is no longer European or Indian or black, but Mexican. And this is the great innovation of Latin America in general and of Mexico in particular. The creation of a new human being. This does not happen in Asia, does not happen in Africa, only recently in, La in North America. And Frida embodies this mixture of cultures. Not only because her father was a uh, Hungarian, German, Hungarian Jew, and her mother, uh, an indigenous Mexican. This is a subject that she would paint several times in her life. But in a broader sense, Frida is a mestiza, is Mexican, because she's able to bring in her art all the many strains that exist in Mexican culture from the pre-Hispanic, as we can see in these works, and I wanted to put them side by side, so you can see how Frida is not replicating the pre-Hispanic. Rather, she is creating something different, something original, inspired by this. But Frida also incorporates her European identity. She is a study uh, of Botticelli. She studies uh, the costumbrista school of Jose Maria Estrada and others. And she is also a person that is nourished by the popular culture of Mexico. In some regions of Mexico, when children die young, when they, when they are you know, in their burial, they're, they're dressed according to the saint after which they were baptized. So Frida incorporates this tradition she also is influenced by popular art of Mexico. In many churches, we have what we call the retablos, that are these paintings with which people thank God for a divine intervention. And they commission these pieces that often have a simple narration to describe the miracle. So Frida uses this style of work, these paintings made in metal, in tin, not to copy the retablos, but to express something of her own that is very different. Even in her persona, as was described so eloquently by Rina Lasso and Arturo Garcia Bustos, Frida uses the clothes of the indigenous peoples of Mexico in a deliberate way. It's not that she was raised in that manner. 
Frida was a middle class girl. Her, her choice of wearing Tijuana dresses and necklaces and all this is a, a, a conscious decision. And it is also a creative decision. Frida uh, sometimes fuses different cultures in her dress. Here, for example, you see to your right the Tehuanas of El Istmo de Tehuantepec. And to your right, you see the monjas coronadas that were these nuns or these novices that before they became nuns, they did these portraits of them, all with flowers. Look what Frida Kahlo does. She incorporates elements of the Tehuana women and the flowers of the nun with her own ideas. In this case, you know, her, her obsession with Diego Rivera, the obvious relation to the oriental idea of the third eye. But she brings all of these things together to express her own reality, her own life. So you see, Frida Kahlo is, is many things. She is a woman that is simultaneously traditional and modern, a woman that can wear a rebozo, but can also admire Picasso you know, or Matisse. And a new type of feminist, a woman that is independent, that is strong, but that also is nourished by the traditional weapons of femininity. Frida Kahlo could spend as much time dressing as she could painting. And both had the same creative intention. Both were liberating and empowering. She was born in the same place where she would die, the Blue House of Coyoacán in 1907. This is a, a painting that she would do called My Birth. It's a tragic painting. You see the mother covered as, as if she were dead, and Frida herself being born dead. And then you see, you know, in, over the bed, the figure of a suffering virgin. You see, the conditions of Frida's birth were very difficult. Her older brother had just died, so the family was still mourning the death of their only son. And a few months, well, 10 months after her birth, her sister Christina was born. And so she never had the kind of attention a mother normally gives a child. And because the proximity of the birth of her sister, they had to hire uh, an Indian nanny to breastfeed her, that she would paint in this work dressed uh, with a mask of Teotihuacan as if to symbolize that she was nourished not just by a woman, but by a culture. Frida would remember how one day they found the nanny totally drunk. That was the end of the nanny, but Frida says, that also explains the good milk I received. <laughs> and, uh, and she grew in this uh, enormous plaza in Mexico. Here you see a couple of photos of Frida as a young girl. And here you see her surrounded by these figures of popular art in a huge Mexican plaza. Now, Frida had only sisters. And her mother was this beautiful woman. And Frida herself said that she had become hysteric because of religion. Religion does that to you sometimes. <laughs> I believe that there was more than that, though. Uh, she had suffered a lot. She was not really in love with Frida's father. And before that, she had had a tragic love affair because the boyfriend, that was also German, had committed suicide in her presence. And so the father, uh, I mean, she grew up in a, in a very, the father, the father was Jewish, not non-practicing. But the mother was fervently Catholic. 
And Frida, here is a very strange photograph of Frida Kahlo doing her first communion. You have never seen this one before. Uh, Frida grew up in a very religious background. They even had a, a permanent uh, seat in the church. They, you know, went to mass every day. And even though Frida would later become a communist and she would you know, be divorced from any kind of religion, but, but you can see this religious influence in her art. Now, sadly, uh, from the very beginning, her life is clouded by tragedy. She's six years old, more or less, and she starts experiencing these terrible pains in her right leg. Eventually, uh, she's diagnosed with polio, and she has to stay in bed for almost nine months. And in her diary, Frida would describe how she conceived or, or what the origins were of, of this painting that was her, it's her most famous work, The Two Fridas. And she would say how she had drawn a, a circle with her own breath in a window. And through that circle, an imaginary friend had come and had taken her to play to wonderful places that she had never seen before. And throughout her art, you see again and again the, this double representation of herself. I am intrigued by the idea of how, since the very beginning, Frida uses her imagination as a way to compensate for the lack of physical mobility. In other words, her imagination are also her legs and her wings. She would recover from polio, and as a result of this, she would become very close to her father, Guillermo Calo. Guillermo Calo was a photographer, and uh, he was a, a foreigner, so he was a man that was trained to see. And he is worried about Frida's leg and wants to exercise her. Also, Frida becomes a little bit the son that he had lost. So in many ways, he trains her, he treats her as a boy. You know, he, he trains her to ride bicycles and to do all the activities that normally boys do. Uh, then he takes her on walks across the countryside and they pick up these things and then the father has this microscope and he looks at the things that they picked up in the microscope. And these magnified images are very important for Frida because they give her a vision that is different from reality. In many of her works, you see this microscopic reality. Notice, for example, in this work how she paints every detail, every vein of the leaves. She would later become the assistant of her father and she would learn to retouch color photography. So notice how everything is extremely detailed. She acquires this photographic technique that she would later use to paint fantastic images. And part of the power of Frida Kahlo is this strange combination of a fantastic vision and a photographic position that she learned with her father. Now, if the father was the greatest individual influence in her life, it was surely the Mexican Revolution that was the greatest social factor. The Mexican Revolution, this year we celebrate its centennial, began in 1910 and uh, changed the country. Changed the country dramatically, uh, among other things because during the long dictatorship of Porfirio Diaz, the Mexicans lived chained to their land. But the revolution makes the Mexicans of the north go to the south, of the east to the west. And suddenly, the Mexican hears the songs of another Mexican. In other words, this is a great cultural feast, a great celebration. 
Frida's works hardly ever reflect the revolution, with the exception of this piece that captures the Adelitas and Pancho Villa. But perhaps the greatest influence is how this new way of looking at Mexico affects everything. Jose Vasconcelos, which is the new Secretary of Education, I wish we had people like that in power today, believed that arts and education are intimately linked. The great problem of our education system today is that it has expelled the arts from the classrooms. And without art, education is very boring. That is part of the problem. It is very boring for the kids to suffer reading, writing, and arithmetic without adventure, without literature, without music, and without art. Vasconcelos understands this, and he gives opportunity to the artists. He brings them to do these huge murals in the schools, in the public offices, everywhere. And Frida Kahlo is a student in the high school where Diego Rivera paints his first mural, Creation. Now, at the time, Frida was part of a rebellious group of students that called themselves Los Cachuchas. And she was the girlfriend of Alejandro Gomez Arias. And one day, they were riding on a bus, probably very similar to this one that she would paint many years later. And when they were getting close to Coyoacán, the bus was struck by a trolley. So you had the bus against the wall, and Fida would describe how it happened, everything happened very slowly. Suddenly, the bus exploded. And one of the rails crossed Frida, like the sword a bull, she would say, entering from her back and exiting through her vagina. In the process, her spine was broken three times, her pelvis was crushed, her leg broken 11 times, her foot completely smashed, and she had profound abdominal wounds. Alejandro would say that apparently one of the passengers of the bus was a house painter with golden dust and that he suddenly turned and he saw Frida completely nude in this puddle of blood and that the golden dust had fallen all over her body. He said it looked like a work of art. At first the Red Cross volunteers thought that she was so ill that it was impossible to save her and tended other patients. And when they finally got to her, they placed her body in a billiards table. And it is said that when they pulled the metal rod out of her body, her scream was so intense that for a moment you could not listen to the sirens. She spends about, she would do after the accident this birth certificate to an imaginary child called Leonardo. It's almost like if this accident was a birth of sorts. And she spends about a month in the hospital, and then they bring her back to her home. She's completely immobilized because of, of the broken back. She has to wear these corsets. And the mother puts a mirror on top of the bed, in the canopy of the bed, and eventually she designs a an easel for her to paint. 
And I would like to say that uh, it is in these painful circumstances in which Frida becomes an artist. It's very different from most artists. It's not that she's trying to conquer the world or become famous. It's something much more important than that, much more intimate than that. Frida sees her painting as a way of rebuilding her broken body, as a way of recovering the mobility that the accident had taken away. She writes some letters that are so profound. She says, you don't know how terrible it is to acquire knowledge suddenly, as if lightning struck the earth. Now I live in a cold planet, transparent as ice. My girlfriends became women very slowly. I grew old in an instant. And then, when she sends her first self-portrait, it's much more than a painting. It's to the boyfriend, and she tells him, put it where it can see you. In other words, it's like if the painting were doubling for herself. Frida did not like to explain her self-portraits. She wanted the paintings to speak directly to the audience. And I want to do just that. So, Tyler, if we could please lower all the lights, and I would like to show some of Frida's self-portraits in complete silence. Once, uh, Picasso wrote to Diego Rivera, and he said, nor you, nor Durain, nor anybody else can paint eyes and heads like Frida Kahlo. You can get them back up again later. Frida liked to say that in her life, she had suffered two major accidents. One, when the trolley ran over the bus that she was riding in, and the other was Diego Rivera. I like, uh, here is a portrait that uh, Frida did of Diego. Uh, Bertram Wolff used to say that only love could produce such a portrait. <laughs> and this is a, a self-portrait by the maestro himself. Many anecdotes of how they met. Some say that they were introduced by Tina Modotti. I'd love to give a lecture someday of Tina Modotti, if anybody showed up. Uh, Tina is a woman with no country, no? Beautiful artist. Uh, and, uh, but the, the anecdote that both Diego and Frida tell is how she had done these paintings after the accident, and she wanted an opinion. And so she goes to the place where Diego was painting in the scaffold, Secretaría de Educación Pública, and she says, Diego, baja! Nobody spoke to Diego that way, no? She's really esta mucha. And Diego says he looked at, and he saw this beautiful girl, and he says her eyebrows were so close and beautiful that it looked like a blackbird about to fly. 
And so he comes down, and, and Frida, Frida tells him, looks at the works, and, and uh, Frida does not want him to give her a compliment just because she's a woman. So she says, no, I want you to give me your honest opinion. My family are very poor. I need you to tell me if I can make a life with this. And Diego is very impressed. He says, uh, he would later say that Frida had a fundamental visual honesty in her works. And so he offers to monitor her progress and visit her at her home. And so one thing leads to another. And so one day the, you know, the father calls Diego and tells her, look, I see you like my daughter, huh? I'll tell you something. She's the devil. <laughs> She's intelligent, but not pretty. And she will always be sick. I'll tell you about, now help me, Dad. <laughs> but if you want to marry her, I will give you my consent. Diego was about 20 years older than Frida. And uh, they married the 21st of August of 1929. Here you see the, the wedding photograph. The mother was very depressed because she said that this was like the wedding between an elephant and a dove. She was a they lived uh, a little bit in Cuernavaca and then they came to the U.S. to San Francisco. This is a, a, a painting of the couple. Frida continued to evolve in her works. You see this portrait of Luther Burbank, in which she's not only painting what she sees, but also what she knows and what she imagines. Luther Burbank is a, a botanist, and she would combine what he, his, his person with his death and how his death nourished his life. Then Diego would travel to New York and eventually to Detroit, where he would complete his mural cycle in the Detroit Institute of Art. And Frida, I, I want to show you a little clip of that moment. Enter film, please. Here you see uh, Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo. Diego is painting this wonderful mural in Detroit. I want to thank the DIA for their support. Now, while Dio was doing these big, uh, massive frescoes to deal with history and society, Frida paints these very intimate works. And she's pregnant. But because of her broken pelvis, she could never carry a baby to term. Some of the doctors had given her the illusion that maybe she could have a baby by cesarean. So she proceeds with the pregnancy, but she starts experiencing these terrible hemorrhages, and eventually she loses the baby. And she would create this work that is considered her first masterpiece, in which she would present herself alone in a bed, bleeding, surrounded by the symbols of her miscarriage. Few things are more brutal than a miscarriage, because the body is getting ready to have birth, and suddenly it's not just the, the, the death of the baby, but the interruption of every vital flow. It's like making your body into a tomb. And Frida captures this. It has been said that Frida is the only artist that reveals her entire biological truth. And here, she starts using these symbols to communicate what she's feeling, you know? The broken pelvis, the, the baby. 
the suffering, the, the, the loneliness. And while she's still in the hospital, she tries to understand what's going on with her. She asks the doctors for books. She, they don't want to give her those. And Diego brings her them. And she starts experimenting. She does this lithograph that uh, is owned by Rina and Arturo. Maybe tomorrow we'll bring it. We'll see. We can. Uh, and, and she does these works. And you see how she's trying to, again, use painting not to sell or to become famous, more to understand what has happened to her, what she's going through, what she is experiencing. And she would continue to work, even in spite of her sorrow. She would do this work that it compares uh, Mexico and, and the US. And then in New York, where Diego created his scandal with his mural in Rockefeller Center. By the way, I tried again to put this mural back in Rockefeller Center with Lenin and all, got no response. <laughs> I want to do this lecture in New York, but no, no luck. No. And uh, Frida would return to Mexico. Diego had always had many lovers. And Frida, you know, just to say, well, who would be interested in marrying a man that was not appealing to other women? However, when he returns from New York, he has uh, an affair with Frida's sister, Cristina. So it's in response to this, he would create, she would create this work called Unos Cuantos Piquetitos, A Few Small Nips. And it is based on a tabloid story about a man that stabs his lover more than 30 times. And when the police arrest him, he says, oh, come on, I only gave her a few small nips. Le di solamente unos cuantos piquetitos. And it's a very dramatic work. And notice how the blood seems to come out of the painting. It's almost like it touches you. And then the strange humor, you know, this kind of macabre humor that is so Mexican that Frida would recreate in her works. Now, Frida also had uh, lovers herself, uh, artists like Nicholas Murray and Isamu Noguchi. And Murray did some beautiful color portraits of Frida that are not so well known and that I wanted to share with you this evening. Enter film, please. I like this, this little film clip because you see Frida with her mustache and with her big eyebrows. In those days, people used to kind of thin their eyebrows a lot, no? And the mustache was gone, of course. But what I like is Frida uh, accepting herself and making a virtue of herself. I think that uh, that is something very appealing uh, to people. I've always believed that uh, the fashion world is controlled by these men that hate women. No? <laughs> totally misogynist. They propose these impossible models to, to reach. No? And, uh, and Frida defies them, invents her own fashion, defines her own beauty, constructs her own self, and does not allow any men to define her or, 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 or she does not adapt to any fashion. She makes her fashion. For 50 years, Frida's closet was sealed. And recently, it was opened. And we have beautiful books about it and beautiful photographs. I would like to share some of these. We have a, an original Frida Kahlo dress that you can see in the intermission. Uh, gracias, thanks to Rina Lasso that lent it to us. And when you look at, at her dresses, you see that, yes, a lot of them are of indigenous origin, but not all. Sometimes she uses Chinese pieces. She combines different types of jewelry. She reinvents herself, tries one earring of one sort. And she also uh, uses the dress to cover her wounded parts, her weakened parts, those traces of sorrow. But what I'm very interested is how Frida constructs a character. 
and how she invests time in putting flowers in her hair and, and dressing and creating her own persona. The, there seems to be no difference between the intensity with which she would create uh, her look as with which we would decorate a table or she would do a painting. Everything seems to be connected. Everything seems to be a part of the same vital impulse. And sometimes these things that she collects, these dresses that she owns, become part of her paintings, as in this, this dress becomes part of uh, one of her most important works, My Dress Hangs There, that she would do at the same time Diego was painting his Rockefeller mural. Or in another character. Now, perhaps Frida's most uh, famous uh, lover would be Russian revolutionary Leon Trotsky, that was given asylum in Mexico in 1938 through the intervention of Diego Rivera. And here we have a film of Frida receiving Trotsky in Mexico. Trotsky had been the founder of the Red Army of the Soviet Union. And when Stalin consolidates his power, he persecutes uh, Trotsky and every dissident. And Trotsky comes to Mexico and lives in Frida's Blue House for two years. And here you see Frida Kahlo, uh, dressed as a legendary princess, as André Breton would say, receiving Leon Trotsky. This is a, a painting that Frida would dedicate to Trotsky. Here you see the dedication note. Now, when Trotsky was living in Frida's house, also Breton, the father of surrealism, came. And when Breton saw Frida's work, he thought it was the very essence of surreality. He was particularly impressed by this work, in which Frida paints herself in a bathtub. And in the water, you see reflected all these things that are going through her mind, the sinking dress, you know, the, the spiders, uh, and this image of Frida with another woman as her mother and father. Watch, it's a scene that she would paint again in another painting. Frida also uh, had uh, a very plural vision of love. And let me show you a wonderful clip that I uh, have found. Enter film, please. Ah, you thought you were going to see more, no? <laughs> Frida is clearly influenced by surrealism. She practices some of the, like the cadáveres exquisitos, or the uh, free uh, expression of ideas as they come. But she also has many important differences with the surrealists. Mainly that she looks at her own background. Also that her communications are very direct. For example, a painting like this is called Thinking in Death. And the meaning of the work is immediate and apparent. Now, if you look at a work like this, The Dream, you would say, well, if that's not surrealist, what is? No? You see this floating bed. But actually, Frida did have a skeleton above her bed, as you can see in this photograph. The late 30s are the most productive in Frida's life. She travels to New York where she has a solo exhibit in the Julian Levy Gallery. And then in Paris, uh, this painting, uh, the frame is acquired by the Louvre. And she would meet and befriend uh, the greatest artists of her day like Marcel Duchamp and Pablo Picasso who would give her those famous earrings in the form of hands that she would paint in many of her self-portraits. She would also get commissions like this one. 
This was commissioned by the wife of the editor of Time magazine. There was this woman you know, who had uh, committed suicide, and she wanted to give her a portrait for her mother. So Frida did this painting. It was never given to the mother. You know? <laughs> but it is interesting to see how she combines the retablo technique with an almost film-like dimension to the work. So, we were talking about how uh, the 30s are Frida's most uh, productive life. She, she connects with the surrealists that call her one of, of their own. She has uh, success in New York and in Paris. And when she, uh, when she returns to, to Mexico, her, her whole life is changed, is, is, is because Diego uh, asks her for a divorce. To, and uh, as she had done in Detroit, this idea of confronting the, the most intimate painful experiences and to somehow try to make sense of them or to understand them through art and with her creative powers. Diego had been the, the, the person that had introduced Frida to, to art and had opened it for her a world and, for, and now separating from him. But as is a constant in, in her work, her response is with great works of art. Perhaps the most famous painting of Frida Kahlo is the two Fridas, las dos Fridas that we see here. And in it, she would paint the dressed with a Tijuana costume, the Frida that Diego loved, and in a white dress, the dress, interestingly, you know, of, a, of a bride, you know, the, the, the Frida that Diego no longer loved. And both are connected with blood. One holds a tiny portrait of Diego Rivera in her hand. And both share this kind of solidarity within her. Again, this uh, idea that sometimes you can find within power and companionship and the strength to move on in spite of everything. And what is so amazing is how Frida makes sense of things by painting them, by understanding them. She does this work where she presents herself dressed as a man with her hair cut, and above, you know, the, the words, mira si te quería fue por tu pelo, ahora que estás pelona ya no te quiero. Look, if I loved you, it was because of your hair. Now that you don't have any hair, I don't love you anymore. And then, you know, in her diary, she would talk about what colors meant to her. And it's interesting because she says that yellow for her was the color of madness. 
And in this painting, we see this, this, the scissors very close to her sex. And then the hair, it's like her cut femininity, you know, like animals on a yellow chair. And now this masculine image of Frida is there from the very beginning. You, you find uh, photos of Frida dressed as a man from the very beginning. And as Carlos Monsiváis says, what is amazing is Frida's uh, ability to confront sickness and pain and deception with this kind of affirmation of life, this vitality. She refuses to be, to be pitied by anybody. The true scandal of Frida Kahlo is not that she had lovers or that she had women or men. No, the true scandal is that she's a desperately ill woman with 30 surgeries in her back that ignores that pain, that ignores this condemnation of life. Once Frida said, I was murdered by life and lives on in spite of the surgeries and in spite of the pain and in spite of the, uh, having everything against her. That is the true scandal of Frida, a woman that refuses to be considered an invalid, refuses to be a victim, and that lives intensely and fully and completely And in her times of greater sorrow, Frida does some of her best work. Most of Frida's paintings are very small, with the exception of the two Fridas that we just saw, and this painting. Now, this painting is interesting. It's a, it's a lost Frida Kahlo. Nobody knows where this painting is. And if you remember the image that I showed you when we started the lecture of this like, young girl surrounded by these figures of popular culture, it's almost like she brings these figures again in this painting. If you ever see it, give me a call. <laughs> now the the divorce uh, between Frida and Diego did not last too long. There was this American doctor that uh, gave Diego Rivera a certificate in which he was declared medically incapable of fidelity. <laughs> because of glandular reasons. I mean, he podía. So they... Uh, they remarry in San Francisco. And uh, much has been said of Diego, the womanizer, and Frida. Well, I don't know what the, the womanizer, what do you say, what would you say of a woman, a manizer? Because <laughs> Frida had as many lovers as Diego, well, not, not, that, not as many, but he had, she had. And uh, I was talking with Rina Lasso yesterday, and she was telling me how uh, Diego said goodbye to Frida, and he started kissing her, and he spent hours kissing her. Y dijeron esto va para largo. So it's interesting to observe how this couple that breaks all the the rules of society all the conventions of society, what you should be and what you should not be, and what is right and what is wrong, 
had a strong love for each other. And we can see that in, in the letters that they exchanged. We can also see it in the paintings. Here you have Frida almost presenting herself as a single being with Diego. Or this one, where Diego Rivera somehow becomes the, the son that Frida Kahlo never had. It's, it's a powerful piece. Because it is an embrace not only of her husband, but a little bit what, what we were hearing you know, about nature and animals, this kind of holistic embrace, total embrace. And enter film, please. It's a movie where you, you look at the, at the relationship. You know? The Blue House, that is now a, a museum, became uh, a, a, a truly magical space, you know, really filled with, with monkeys and dogs and birds, and incredible parties because in spite of her illness, Frida continued to give these massive parties. Guadalupe Rivera, some years ago, published a book of Frida's recipes. They're magnificent. The best chiles en nogada we've ever had. Music, this affirmation of joy, of, of cooking, of, of sex, of wholeness. And I find uh, there's a lot of these art historians that try to separate Frida's art from her biography. And they say, no, that biography is just for gossip columnists. I'm not interested in the affairs. I'm a pure art critic, right? Only going to deal with the art. I find that it is impossible because the art and the life are intertwined. And the same way that the dresses reappear in the paintings, you also see the dishes, and you see the, the cooking, and you see the love affairs. Every, everything comes together. For instance, Frida is, is known, basically, for her self-portraits. But she is also the author of some of the most powerful still lives of the 20th century, Salomon Grimberg, uh, did a, a beautiful book on these things. And these paintings that traditionally are boring paintings, paintings of fruits and flowers, the kind of thing you put in your living room or your dining table, no? Mainly the dining table. With Frida become intensely a Erotic. This, this painting that we're seeing here was given to one of Mexico's first ladies. And the woman was shocked because the central papaya looked so much like a vagina. And you know what the idiot did? She gave it back. Now the grandkids must be cursing her. Huh? Nothing in Frida is boring. Everything is intense. Everything is... Look at this. This is one of my favorites. It's called The Bride. O sea, la novia que se espanta. 
cuando ve la vida abierta. The bride that is surprised when she sees life opening. And notice how those watermelons open. Or Or look at this one. All those kinds of they look like penises and vaginas and the red and everything is there. <laughs> Suddenly a, a, a painting that could be completely boring no? becomes intensely erotic. Bold as love itself. Or this piece, no? It's a flower, but it could also be a uterus or a penis. It doesn't matter. And it's not just sexual. The force is not just sexual. These fruits could be bleeding, no? And these are clearly dying. Sometimes, you know, the painting becomes life itself. Frida's incapacity to, to have children, her, her desire to give life to things, materializes in her works. Here you see her literally fertilizing a barren ground with her own blood. And she surrounds herself with children, she, with dolls, she paints them exquisitely and, and beautifully. This is a work, and I, I, I had the, the privilege a few months ago to, to see this painting in my hand. It's a masterpiece. Everything is painted, everything is described, every little thing is, is something. And she puts these like skeletons, and she puts all the, the, the gods and all the heroes, and she says, the reason people look for religion and look for heroes is fear. Fear of life and fear of death. And here, you know, she, you see her painting every religious figure from, you know, the Christianity to Hinduism. And then in the center, she connects all this world with her own, this sky of, of, of milk, the figure of Moses. You know? Freudian theme and book. She also uh, surrounds herself with, with monkeys and animals and all of them become part of her art. Doves, birds. And of course these works can be read at many levels. This is a painting that she did right after her father had died. And you could say that the caterpillar becoming a butterfly is a, a metaphor of the transformation of life. Perhaps her most famous painting with animals would be inspired by her little deer, Granizo. But 
in an opposite way to the traditional deer dance in which you paint a man with the head of a deer, Frida would do a deer with her face. But this deer is, is wounded and, and condemned. It's an extraordinary piece. And in it you see the internalization of all these influences, the Christian influence. It's clear, you know, the San Sebastian iconography, the personal suffering. Or masterpieces like these in which again you, you see the the Christian thorns, the hummingbird. But nowhere is Frida's uh, in subconscious better captured than in her diary. It took many years for the diary to be published and when it came out, I guess people were disappointed because it told much less and much more than what they expected. They probably expected a vulgar tell-all like the ones we get today. But what Frida does is a, a window into her soul. It's truly really amazing. I mean, this, let me see that film clip, please. Here you see Frida with her hands full of rings looking at this masterpiece that is her diary. Something that was not done to sell to anybody. She couldn't give a damn about the money or all those stupid things we worry today. Stupid to be thinking of selling anything. And see that thinks about things that are much more important than that. Nothing salacious or vulgar or stupid. She puts, for example, all this idea of the surrealists of what they call automatic writing, which is to basically write the first things that come out of your mind. You can try this tonight. Get a white piece of paper and just put right immediately everything that comes to your mind. You will be amazed at what comes out. She does this in... in or... Things like uh, the accident, the, 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 you, you put like a, an ink spot and then you look into that ink spot and you draw around it or within it. It is also amazing Frida's uh, qualities as a writer. Raquel Tibol has published several books about Frida's writings and letters. And I wanted just to share a love letter to Frida, of Frida, to Carlos Pellicer. In Spanish, she says, Se pueden inventar verbos. Yo quiero decirte uno. Yo te cielo. Así, mis alas se extenderán enormes para amarte, sin medida. Gracias porque vives, porque ayer me dejaste tocar tu luz más íntima y porque dijiste con tu voz y con tus ojos lo que yo he esperado oír toda mi vida. Can, I, can, I, can you invent verbs? I, I want to invent one for you. I, I sky you. I sky you. This way, my wings will extend enormous to love you without measure. Thanks for, for being alive, for, for letting me touch your most intimate light, and for saying with your eyes and with your voice what I have been waiting for all of your life. To be able to say that, And all of this, between surgeries and between pain, 
painting in the most awful conditions, trying desperately to hide the, not hide, to, to, to surpass the pain. And even making fun of it. You know, once they asked her, Frida, why do you drink so much? And she said, look, I drink to drown my sorrows, but the damn things have learned to swim. <laughs> These are the, the torturous corsets that Frida had to wear. And she paints them. Enter film, please. Here you see a, one of the last films of Frida. And it is not that she uh, denied what was happening to her. I mean, she, Frida leaves us some testimonies of pain that are unforgettable. The, the broken column that Arturo Garcia Bustos described, nails, Perhaps the downturn in Frida's life happened in 1946. She was convinced of doing a, a surgery in the US where they would fuse her spine with metal and bone. But the surgery was a, a disaster, it didn't work. And uh, the spine, the, the, the wound was infected and Frida never really recovered from that. But in this painting, in which again she presents herself with herself, she holds this tiny banner that says, Árbol de la Esperanza, mantente firme. Tree of hope, stay firm. And in closing, I would like to share with you the last painting of Frida Kahlo. It's a painting of watermelons. And then in the central watermelon, Frida would write a word that not only define her position in life, but interestingly, are also a response to fascism. In Salamanca, the hideous fascists led by Francisco Franco occupied the University of Salamanca with the cry of Viva la Muerte. And Unamuno responded to them, Venceréis porque tenéis la fuerza, pero no convenceréis porque para convencer hay que tener la razón. So you will win because you have the force, but you will not convince because to convince you must have reason. And so I believe that in this last statement, Frida was not only affirming her beliefs, but was confronting the fascists here in this painting. In the central watermelon, she would write her name, the date, and then with big capital letters, she would write 
the words, Viva la vida. Long live life. Thank you very much. Funding for Live at the Ford has been made possible in part